So you started Raffer in 2004 and sold it for 200 million. I would encourage everyone to consider doing it, but it's bloody hard. You've got to almost be prepared to kill yourself to make it work. It's all about execution. It's not about having the best plan. You have to keep pushing, keep pushing, and there's more and more you have to do. We had six months, basically. We had nothing. So they had no idea who we were. We just came completely around the outside. We'd grabbed the sport in a way, and we just vomited the whole thing out, yeah. you know, over about five years of enthusiasm. And it made the brand feel incredibly sophisticated and big and established, when it, in fact, it was only a couple of dozen people yeah. going mad. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to have you on. I'm gonna get straight into it. I'd love for you to give us a whistle-stop tour of your entire career in a few <laughs> bullet points. Uh, in a few bullet points, there's two themes. Mm -hmm. The themes are branding. I'm a brand guy. I learned about branding when I was you know, quite young when branding was just becoming something quite big. And I'm a cyclist. And those two things sort of thread through everything. But I started Life, uh, went to college, grew up in Yorkshire, then the Midlands, then desperate to come to London, always wanted to be in London, I've been here ever since, went to university, spent a year abroad at university in the south of France, I'm obsessed with the south of France, and that definitely informs what I've been doing more recently. Um, and then I trained as an accountant because I didn't know any, I had no other idea, and I thought I'll do this, and for four years I did that really hard training, and it wasn't me, but I got through it, and um, Unlike all the other accountants who went on to the city and made lots of money, I decided to go into design and branding and marketing because I was interested. So I went in uh, to value brands. So this was back in the day, they just started working out how you could put a financial value on a brand, mm -hmm. which is an intangible asset. So in the accounting field, this was like revolution. In fact, they hated it because, you know, who, who the hell are you to come along yeah. and tell us that you can value brands? But there was this small agency called Interbrand who did that and they pioneered this technique. So I went to work for them. So it went from finance into marketing and brands and worked there for you know man and boy really and learned a lot about brands and identity and companies and how they can position themselves. And, and then worked for some more agencies and eventually found myself starting a brand of my own. Um, so it's sort of finance into brands, a bit of dot-com stuff and then starting Rafa in 2004. Fantastic. Well, you so you went down that kind of very traditional route at the beginning in terms of the accountancy. Did you always know that you would? Did, did you kind of think at that stage, I'm going to be an accountant, or was it always going to be a kind of passage to where you wanted to go? It was always a passage to where I wanted mm -hmm. to go. It was quite a hard choice actually, because it is quite hard work. I mean, yeah. If anybody's doing that, you have to work and study at the same time, which is not easy. So it wasn't a sort of, you know, an, an easy choice, but I just thought, no, this will really help. My dad was an accountant, so I said mm -hmm. I'd never be an accountant. Right. And, and so that's the sure first thing enough, you did. <laughs> I had to do it. And um, But I always knew I'd, I'd do something else. I was the only person at Pricewaterhouse, I think, who read Design Week and Blueprint magazine, which is an architecture magazine. So, you know, I was always thinking about other things, mm. but I was trying to learn this basics of business thing. And do you think that gave you a lot of the you know, the skills that you've had since then to be able to, or, or even at that beginning stage, to be able to then build Rafa? It was a brilliant education. Back at, back then, you you could do accounting if you were a French graduate, if you were a history graduate, classics. Mm. You didn't have to have done business studies or accounting or finance or anything like that. So they brought you in and they told you, they informed you and educated you about how businesses work and how finance works. And I'm sure it's been really helpful. I tried to sort of push it away for a long time. You know, that's my distant past, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter, but actually it's always helped. Being able to read a balance sheet and, you know, knowing how the PL works is pretty important stuff if you're starting a company. Oh, 100%. And where then did that original kind of thirst for entrepreneurship come from? Yeah, I'm a creature of the, I grew up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And in the 80s, there was this whole thing going on where Thatcher was in power mm -hmm. and we'd gone from being this sort of slightly broken country, we were broken in other ways, but there's this whole thing of you should be an entrepreneur, you should start your own thing. Mm. It was lauded in you know, adverts, commercials, TV series. It became part of the culture that the cool people, the people who were admirable were people who started their own thing or ran their own thing. And it was, you know, it was a weird time in the 80s. You, know, you had BA ads about 
people taking the red eye from New York and that was supposed to be a really cool thing. Right. You know, turning up to the office having done the red eye. <laughs> Whoa. You know, it was very much like that. It's very and like I, American dreamy. It was it was very much America coming here, which so mm. much of our way of life and culture comes from the US. And that was definitely part of it. And so I grew up with all this around me. And my father worked for a, an entrepreneur who had three or four different businesses. So that was always there as well. So I think it was just something I always felt I should do. And then when I was a consultant for many, many years, and you get quite bored as a consultant, going back to the client with more and more ideas, and they don't always yeah. do what you suggest. And so you're thinking, well, why can't I be the client? You know, one day I'd like to be the other side of the desk with my own thing. Um, so I just felt I had to do it. Yeah. So it was kind of, I guess, seen if it was, the, you know, who your dad was working for, and it was it was kind of everywhere and all these ads and everything. It was kind of your version of what you could see as success, would you say oh, at that time? Totally. So I'll give you an, an, an idea, which probably goes straight over your head. Renault 20, there was this car called the Renault 20. And mm -hmm. It was like a sort of gold colored kind of estate car, sort of saloon estate car thing. It was yeah. quite an aspirational thing. Well, I don't know, maybe it wasn't, but it was like, <laughs> do you know, have you ever heard of the gold blend couple? No. No, this is all 80s throwbacks. So <laughs> there was this like perfect, everything was perfect back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all about being perfect. So there's this couple who was like 40 something. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's driving this car. You start with a close up of him driving the car, and his, probably his wife, you don't know, but is sitting next to him, sort of. And he's talking about, you know, Johnny's with me, Grace is with me, and we've got the backing. And it's basically him telling her that he's going to start this thing. And she looks up at him, sort of, you know, in yeah. admiration, goes, oh, darling, that's wonderful. <laughs> then the, the camera goes back and the car's going through the sort of mountains or whatever. And it's like, that's what you were supposed to grow up to do. That's... To be like that. Well, to be a man like that and a woman like that. Which yeah. Is pretty weird now. Yeah. But also to start something, to go from being, working for the man to doing your own thing. That's so interesting as well, because I think that for, for me, growing up, the kind of corporate graduate role kind of route, that was my view of success. That was kind of what was presented to me as you get into the best, and I, I know this will be a very, you know, particular section um, of, you know, society and people at university and all of that, that it was kind of presented to me as like, that is what you do that is successful. Mm. If you're really clever, you could be a management consultant. If you're, you know, really great at this, you could work at Goldman and all of these different things. And it was seen as, you earn your stripes, you go somewhere for 30 years, it's a meritocracy and you kind of like move up and you make loads of money in the city. And that that to me was it. Whereas, but I think that is still, that that was true in my generation yeah, as well. Yeah, it was just different, a different view. I think I just soaked up something slightly different. Right. I took a different lens to it. And yeah, most of my friends went to work for Goldman and mm. management consultancies and you know, Bain or what have you, because that was the right thing to do. And lots of them were lawyers. And so there was still definitely professional types and big business, big company types. I just never wanted that, to that. That wasn't your view of success. No. Whereas I just soaked up whatever I was fed. I just <laughs> <laughs> spoon feed me, cool. <laughs> Go be a big old capitalist down the road then. And then you changed. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. And so at, at this time, were you were you cycling a lot? Was that one of your big passions? Uh, I didn't really start cycling seriously till my mid-20s. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, I rode because we all rode. And they started to show the Tour de France in 1982 on mm -hmm. TV. Well, but that was... A, important breakthrough because suddenly you could watch this thing and go wow this is amazing and everyone would tune in just to look at the countryside and see all these brightly colored people in lycra cycling around france every july and i fell in love with the sport then but i didn't really start riding properly till i was about 25 26 and so i already had i was almost married by then and i you know i'd already sort of got a career so it wasn't something that i always was always a massive part of my life i had to create time for it Mm -hmm. Which I think is quite interesting because lots of people don't have time to just become a racer or to throw themselves at sports. They have to make it fit in their lives. And I think that gave me a perspective the customer has. And so where did that initial idea for Rafa come from then? Uh, um, lots of different things. Um, it, just being a cyclist, being a passionate lover of doing it, but not very good. So I love doing it. But really, I'd go to the bike shops and I'd, they'd look down on me as some kind of nodder. We had this expression, nodder. Okay. Which is... Uh, like the muggle of cyclists. Exactly. And different countries have their own version of nodder. I think right. Americans call them Freds. Australians call them something else. But 
you're looking down on the person who doesn't know everything and obviously isn't that fast or doesn't show their legs or there's so many rules they don't their sunglasses are underneath the straps of their helmet and there's all that sort of stuff that's so funny i'm never going into a cycling shop ever again and they're not i mean like not that, that i actually anymore. have ever <laughs> well there you go so yeah so we're on a journey and the fact you haven't been in a bike shop is means we haven't got there yet so so bike shops were worse then but they're still somewhat like that you mm-hmm. know they're populated by people who are really good at riding a bike or mm. racers and they look down on everybody else and they're not good at selling they're not good at selling a dream and actually the stuff is the stuff was horrible the products were horrible mm-hmm. and it was all bikes just racks and racks of bikes which i don't understand bikes i don't know what the difference between this one and that one yeah there was no emotion there was no aspiration to it nobody you know and i was watching this stuff and riding and loving it and it's like this passport to a whole world of discovery mm. and drama and adventure and camaraderie and you walk in a bike shop it's like oh god yeah in fact even jerseys and stuff might be in a box a cardboard box on the floor and you'd have to sort of go through these horrible polyester things and pick them out and wear a team jersey covered in belgian logos and stuff it was a horrible experience so that really struck me and i like clothes and i was pretty in touch with you know brands and what was going on and yet there was this weird backwater which was my backwater and it pissed me off um and i was working in luxury quite a lot and i just felt there's a you know, selling experience and selling aspiration and connecting emotionally with with customers which is what luxury brands always were brilliant at mm. there was an opportunity to do that around this sport and other sports had done it you know skiing had kind of done it surfing had done it mm-hmm. you know quicksilver which was a big brand once yeah. at the time. I don't know if it even exists now, but they had nothing. They just had this idea of the endless summer and the perfect wave, wearing sunglasses and shorts. It's a lifestyle you're selling. And it was just a complete lifestyle, but people loved it. You know? mm. So why can't cycling, this sport, which actually is seen as very niche and dweeby, why can't that be something aspirational? Because to me, it was totally aspirational. So that was the driver. And I didn't know that it could be, Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know what the answer was. So I, and I, at the time I just decided I need to start my own brand. I'd, I'd been consulting long enough. It's like, oh, I've got to do something. So I would write a few business plans, sometimes with other people, sometimes on my own. And they were all a bit rubbish because most business plans are all. rubbish. Yeah. Right? You know, so you've got to keep going, keep going. And at the end, um, you may have felt this as well, at the end of the night when I'd sort of struggled with that software idea or that agency mm. idea or whatever and put them away, I'd come back to my pictures about cycling and my writing and and just do another hour going, okay, so what could it be? What could it be? And before long, it sort of, that became the thing. So you have this idea, you decide to pursue it. Was it the case of you leaving your existing job, throwing yourself completely into it? Or did you Mm. kind of start it on the side? Uh, A friend of mine said to me at the time, he said, the biggest challenge you're going to have, Simon, is managing the catastrophic event, <laughs> which by which he meant going from earning, a, I was earning quite a lot of money as a consultant. Mm-hmm. I was freelance, so I got day rates, so it gave me flexibility, but right. I could charge a lot of money per day. I had a wife and three kids, mm-hmm. one of whom was disabled. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like had this quite complicated, expensive sort of life, and I had to go from that. The catastrophic event was going from that to having... Not very much. Yeah. In fact, almost nothing and starting from scratch. And as it turned out, it wasn't too bad because my wife was incredibly um, understanding and it and it worked. Mm-hmm. And if it hadn't worked, I'd, I always knew I could go back into consulting and I would yeah. have hated to do it, but I could have done it. So it didn't feel like this terrible precipice that I was jumping off. So you kind of created this safety net based on years of work and, and savings, I assume, as well. And I had no savings. You had no oh savings. Oh, my God, no. I had no, no. money at okay. all. No. So, no. so I raised 140 grand, which isn't very much money these days, no, but it be, yeah. wasn't much then either, out of 200 meetings and mm-hmm. just loads and loads of people just trying to get across this idea that cycling could be this cool thing, this lifestyle. Right. And, you know, you don't realise how amazing it is. Yeah. And mostly they go, yeah, nice try. But Yeah, it's one of those things that in hindsight, I'm sure a lot of people look at and say, yeah. of course that makes sense. That makes so much sense. Especially when, you know, when whenever I'm looking at a pitch deck and it kind of says, it's been done in this industry, this industry, this industry, and this one's untouched. That to me makes so much sense. And I'm happy for someone to kind of give that a go. But there'll be certain parts where you're like, yeah, but the reason it hasn't happened because is because of this. Or, 
yes, it seems like a great idea, but if it was such a great idea, then where's Nike? Yeah, or there's where, an adage, uh, the old adage, there's a, there's a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? Which yeah. I used to hear all the time, which mm-hmm. I, I totally get. Um, yeah, I was desperate to find this sort of the Patagonia or the yeah. Nike or whatever, the model I could go, we're going to do that for cycling. But it wasn't one of those. You know, mm. it wasn't Quicksilver. It wasn't Nike. You know, most of those brands sold through wholesale. And I wanted to go direct to the consumer. I wanted a relationship with these other maniacs who love this sport as well. And from that, I wanted to grow it to more people. So that was a totally different business. So I couldn't find the thing that I could just say, here's the playbook. We're going to do that. So it was, it was so risky in so many ways. So, you know, selling clothes to men online mm. in 2004. Oh, I can imagine. You know. The, the D2C model didn't really exist at the time. No, not really. Boo.com so- Boo. had existed. Um, 2001, it crashed. So most people were terribly scared of yeah. e-commerce. Because, it seemed like something that couldn't work. Yeah. And so why did you want to do it at D2C? Because I just felt I had this passion and I... I think the best brands are D2C brands. I think I every agree. brand should be direct to consumer because you should be communing around the thing that you're selling. Mm. And anybody that gets in the way of that is basically making it harder and and uh, reducing the, the value of the interaction or the value of the exchange. So I can see why people do it because it's all about avoiding risk and mm. managing risk. But for me, I had to be direct. So initially it was going to be um, catalogue retailing because back in the right. day there were... L.L. Bean and Patagonia and there were some over here. Toast had just started over here and was, was quite interesting. And so I collected all these. There was a brand called Howie's, which was pretty cool and focused mm-hmm. on a similar sort of area. I thought, yeah, we'll do catalogues. But then I started to work a little bit around the internet and thought, no, hang on a minute. Mm. This has got to be the one because I want to reach people in New York and Melbourne and Tokyo and not just in Basildon and yeah. Laura Wood, you know, which is what most people would do is like mm. go from one place out I knew the customers were all over the place. Yeah. So the internet was perfect for that. Especially if that was something, as you mentioned, that was actually bringing cyclists together was this idea of traveling and adventure and all of these things. If you're keeping that within one small pocket, it doesn't seem to resonate with the whole brand. Totally, totally. And also, I, I just think you have to... Basically, what I wanted to do was to build authenticity and legitimacy mm-hmm. because if you're in a sport, particularly a sport like cycling, you know, it's a bit like other technical sports, you have to be credible. Otherwise, people are not going to buy you. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't credible. You know, I wasn't an ex-pro. I hadn't worked in the industry. I had no track record. So I had to build this sort of credibility so that when people looked at it, they'd go, oh, that brand totally gets it. They see in cycling what I see in cycling. So that's what I felt I could do is I could describe it to them Mm -hmm. and communicate the emotion and communicate the experience because nobody else was doing it. And I was a customer, so I could say that, and that would build me the credibility over time. But that's, that's only for a few people. Mm. You know, some of the, there weren't, weren't many people in the world who'd go, yeah, I get that because I do it, because there weren't that many. So I had to find them wherever they were. So how did you get that initial funding? Uh, just networks and networks. I mean, I, I became obsessed. I mean, the whole thing, the whole Rafa story is obsession. My whole career, really, has all well, the last 20 years has been obsession. It's just relentless. You know, you have to keep talking about it. Oh, anybody I talked to, I was crushingly boring. Every person I talked to was like, um, let me talk to you about cycling. I've got this business idea and blah, 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 blah. And before too long, people were making connections for me. And then people were making connections to other people without yeah. even having met me. It's like, there's this, there's this guy you might want to meet because I've heard about him and he's from a marketing background, but he's going to do something in cycling apparel. You know, how interesting is that? Yeah. You should meet him. So I started, I, mean, I just built this network of you know, amazing people, some of whom were financial, some of whom were designers, some of whom were e-commerce people, mm. and have built a network that could then build a brand. And having then got that 140,000, was it, in, mm. in capital, what was the next step? How did you, how did it go from idea to business? So by that point, I'd got two people to come and work with me, you know, sort of for no money. And I got the money, December 2003, and I said, right, okay, the Tour de France starts on the 4th of July, 2004. We have to launch by the 4th of July, 2004. Otherwise, the peak of the season's come and gone. Mm. And, you know, for cycling, the Tour is still the thing. So we had six months, basically, and we had nothing. So we had six Good. months to build a website from scratch, design and develop products from scratch, um, build the brand. And we had a logo and we had a, a few ideas, but we had nothing. Uh, create a launch, 
um, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we just went at it completely. And who was we at this stage? So it was me and two other people, mm -hmm. um, a guy called Luke, who was a designer that I worked with, a graphic designer, um, who wasn't a cyclist, but liked the idea of it and became completely in, you know, inspired by it. And a, and a woman called Claire, who I'd met through a friend who was really keen to just get involved. So three of us, I think we had two computers between three of us. And we were in a little shop, a little room above a shop in Camden Town called Fantasy Fabrics. <laughs> so it's like a sitcom of a startup. Yeah. And it was actually bright pink, this haberdashery shop. Yeah, it sold um, threads and buttons and fabrics and stuff. It's perfect for upstairs was this technical sportswear business that was growing from nothing. But that's where we started. And the room was you know, much smaller than this room. Mm -hmm. And we started with a white room, two computers, a desk and three chairs. And over six months, it just became plastered with stuff and then we launched. And how was that initial launch, the kind of products you started with, the reception of those products? So the launch was a thing called Kings of Pain. There is a sort of theme about cycling, which is, yeah. it's, you know, it is about suffering. A lot of it is about pushing yourself. And they talked, there was a, um, a description of lots of the heroes of the sport that they were like the kings of pain. It was men. Mm -hmm. There were very few women who were cycling at the time. And the, there was a history of women's racing, but it was very small and nobody knew about it. So these were the kings of pain. So rather than start with a website and go and buy some ads, which is, I suppose, what people were doing at the time, they'd buy print ads, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do advertising because you know, that's, that was a bit dumb. A waste of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a total waste of money. Um, and I didn't want to just be virtual. I had, it had to be real. And a friend of mine said, listen, you're going to have to be physical. As a brand, mm -hmm. you have to be physical. You can't just be digital. I was going on about the internet for a yeah. So I started with a, this exhibition called Kings of Pain, and it was about six of these heroes, my heroes from the glory years, 60s, 70s. Um, we had little areas for each one. We got bikes and blow up photography, and we told stories. And in the corner was three products, I think, uh, a couple of T-shirts, and we had the sample of our first jersey and then some memorabilia, and that was kind of, this is Rafa in the corner. But basically we were saying... The brand is about all this. Yeah. It's not about the garment. It's about loving this sport and come and enjoy it. You know, it was open, I don't know, 12, 15 hours a day. We showed the tour on the wall every day. So people came in and watched the Tour de France and it became like a little magnet for people who yeah. knew about cycling. And they came out of the woodwork and would find their way to this place in the Truman Brewery in the East End. And they were like coming out of the closet. It's like there were lots of these cyclists, but you never see them because they go out in the morning, early in the morning, and they do their laps in the park or whatever, and they'd be, they'd be a bit sad. Yeah. But here was somebody saying, no, this is cool. You can you know, be part of this. So it was quite successful. We built off that. We built quite a good network of customers. Mm. And we got the website launched, obviously, and that's where we were selling. And I can imagine that, you know, this this the idea of cycling that you're kind of portraying is this idea that actually lots of people loved it, but they didn't have anywhere to convene in a community. And it was also this community that seemed quite exclusive, but you wanted it to be exclusive in an inclusive way is yeah. kind of the the idea I'm getting from it. It's like, yeah. you can join the club, but we're in the club, if, yeah. that, if that kind of yeah, makes sense. Yeah, we're proud to be in this club. This mm. is an amazing thing. And, and being proud to be a cyclist is a, a sort of theme of of the journey actually you know why wouldn't you be because it's the best thing in the world it's the greatest way of living your life is by bike and yet we weren't supposed to be like that you mm. know we were told that we were losers and you know motorists still shout at me as you know you're a loser in fact, <laughs> i rode to brighton and back um day before yesterday and as we were coming out of brighton there was a sign that said um ride to uh, ride single file you lycra clad twats <laughs> Somebody had written on a road sign. And that is still pretty Poetic. Much, yeah, that's pretty much the <laughs> British view of what a cyclist is. And it's true around the world. So no, I'm going to be proud of doing this because actually I'd much rather do this than sit in a Ford Transit or a, mm. you know, Mondeo or whatever and, you know, hate myself. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's so interesting. And it's such, a, um, it's such a kind of fun story in the way that you kind of took this Obviously, on a personal level, you wanted this to kind of change yeah. and wanted it to be something that kind of created this community. But you kind of took this uncool niche or this like underdog niche and turned it into kind of what we see in these like high school movies of like, it's cool to be uncool, but you only realize that in hindsight. You only realize that when you're older <laughs> and you're kind of saying, actually, that was really cool that I loved this, but no one, because it I didn't fit in. 
it didn't kind I of... I hadn't thought about it like that. It is a bit sort of, yeah, the geek. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's... she turns into the, the Exactly, and then the ends up <laughs> making it a nine-figure business. Um, yeah, but, but, but there were, I mean, the, the, the truth was that cyclists weren't what people thought they were. Mm. You know, they were... There were loads of designers and architects and sort of creative people. There's, yeah. there's a sort of Venn diagram of people who are in the creative industry and people who, and engineers and stuff, and people who ride a bike. And so they're really interesting people in that crossover. And there were loads of celebrities who actually mm. were quite keen because road racing and this whole sort of, you know, riding in the Alps and Tuscany, it is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. It's quite beautiful. It's mm -hmm. a lovely thing. So under the radar, there were all these quite cool people. And we just, to, you know, brought them out basically. And so you started with community and with kind of products on the side, I guess. How? Well, sort of. No, it had to be products. Mm. So it was, it was Rafa Performance Roadwear. Okay. Uh, and it was we had to say performance because it was so romantic what we were doing and mm -hmm. telling all these lovely stories and and it was a lot of content, but actually it was all about the product and the product had to be better than everything that was out there. And I used to give out flyers at events that said things like demand more from cycling clothing, really pedestrian kind of yeah. like direct straight between the eyes. You should think about spending a bit more for better quality product. This is so funny because one of our taglines as well is like, you should be asking more from your activewear. Like you should be asking it for it to be sustainable, ethical and high performance and look nice and all of these totally, things. Totally. Well, was back, back then, as I described before, it's polyester, mm. shitty, scratchy zips. Yeah. You couldn't spend more than about 40 quid on a jersey. But I'd be going into Selfridges to buy a shirt and I'd be spending 100 quid for a yeah, shirt. Yeah, and you're like, I don't even need to do anything, do anything with it. Yeah, this shirt is just, you know, it doesn't, yeah, it's nothing. So you could only spend about 40 pounds on a jersey, but this is a thing that you're going to wear for eight or nine hours because that's what we do. Sweat in it, go through rainstorms, go up mountains, descend through chilly, you know, ice cold wind. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to carry your tools, your food, your fur, everything that you own, you're going to carry in this thing and you can only spend 40 quid. Mm. And it just didn't make any sense. It was like the, the whole industry had positioned itself as a bit shit. And all I was saying was, it's not a bit shit, it's actually brilliant. And yeah, you should expect more. So as someone with a kind of more traditional and very brand-based background, how did you then decide and manage to scale a product business? Uh, just by enthusiasm. <laughs> just because it was a complete blank canvas there was mm -hmm. nobody doing anything for at least the first five or six years there was no competition because the existing brands were rubbish mm -hmm. and were stuck in their their you know their distribution deals and they weren't direct so they and they weren't focused on us they had no idea who we were we just came completely around the outside and nothing had been done so yeah nobody had there was no great cycling magazine so we started a cycling magazine called Rouleur. Um nobody had done photo shoots where you actually go to amazing places that are relevant mm -hmm. and aspirational and shoot cool people riding their bikes properly so we did that um, nobody had done um book publishing so we published books nobody had made cds about the music to do with the sports so we made cds um people hadn't done nice leather sort of accessories and mm -hmm. there's no like wash bag or you know all that stuff that you buy from other brands nobody had done accessories like that and then nobody had done sort of city wear stuff for, I, I rode around town all the time going to be a to consultant things, yeah. and I'd wear jeans rolled up, dickies rolled up, mm. CD mountain bike shoes and a messenger bag and I thought that was pretty cool but you couldn't buy that stuff so yeah. we made that stuff so and nobody was there so we could make loads of mistakes which I'm sure we did, some of the products were quite out there but you just kept going, kept going, kept going and before we knew it we had really quite a broad range and we told loads of stories so we just we'd grabbed the sport in a way you know nobody had talked about the places that mattered in the sport nobody had talked about the great stories of the heroes in the, the past and we just vomited the whole thing out yeah. you know over about five years of enthusiasm and it made the brand feel incredibly sophisticated and big and established when it, in fact it was only you know a couple of dozen people yeah. going mad but so authentic as well, because you're starting, you're saying you're starting with this blank canvas. And actually, usually when you find a gap in a market and you're starting with a blank canvas, it's, it's, it feels like you really have to kind of test what works. And as you say, then that blank canvas might be blank for a reason and all of these different things where you, you were kind of able to be like, every area of my life 
kind of revolves in some way around this activity that I love, whether that is me traveling to work, whether that is the music I listen to, whether that's any of this. And rather than just talking about selling a lifestyle, which is like the brand 101 mm. currently mm. and has been for a few years, you actually sold every single thing that could improve that lifestyle for that target customer. We created a lifestyle, absolutely. And, and the, 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 the secret to the whole thing, I'm sure, is I was a customer. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't been the customer, we'd never be able to do all those things. And they didn't all work. You know, we made lots of mistakes, but I always kind of instinctively knew that's the right thing to do. And I knew it because I was the customer. I was you know, 37 or something. Our average customer was about 37. Mm. They sort of tend to live in big cities like London or New York or LA or whatever. So we kind of had similar lives. They probably liked similar brands and they loved cycling like I loved it. And they weren't a pro, so they needed certain things and they had a design eye. And so they wanted stuff to be just right and their color, color was important to them. So I could just get it right. And the more you go beyond that niche customer, that particular start point, the harder it becomes because then you have to of start course. doing research and yeah you know. well we we can we talk about when we're developing our products here at Tala we talk about the still being in this tip like this wish list stage so being creating sustainable activewear at a price point that is you know competitive to your Nikes your Gymsharks your kind of where people are buying non-sustainable activewear there are still so many things that we need to, because we are, you know, there's there aren't other people doing that. There are so many things that we currently need to be able to create to even compete on that level. And those are the always the best items we do because we're not at any, you know, we haven't at any point of the past year been really reaching, being like, how can we innovate this legging so people will buy another one? It's still like, Currently, there isn't something that does X, Y, and Z and is sustainable at a competitive price point, and therefore we will make it. And there is so much power in that, but also so much, it just makes it so, it's not easy as a whole, the running the business isn't easy, but that part of the no, product a, makes it so easy. It's such a brilliant phase to be in, because mm -hmm. you, 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 it's so clear mm -hmm. what you're doing. And we have that phase, and we're well beyond that phase now. You know, now we've, but you had to do so many things, you know, gloves, shoes, eyewear. Yeah. base layers, jackets, wind jackets. And for a long time, we've just did the jersey, the wind jacket, mm. the bib shorts, because they were definitive. Now, obviously, we've got, got 10 innovate. types of bib shorts and yeah. 150 jerseys and, you know. And of course, then you can still innovate to get to more, you know, there might be one cycling consumer who's slightly more on the businessy side and therefore needs to do X, Y, and Z and someone who actually is only really doing it for fun or whatever it might be. Yeah, um, yes. But I do think kind of within that, there's there's so much excitement in just being able to be like, you know what? Yes, of course, we're thinking of what colors to be able to do for next season. But beyond that, we know that the real essence to our success next season will be, I was about to <laughs> reveal a product, which I can't do, <laughs> but will be, for we'll example, be like, yeah. Yeah, like last week, we um, released our first ever scorts. So, you know, actually sustainably, there's pretty much no one doing that. And if they're doing it, it's double the price. So even, there's so much excitement around that. How did you manage to maintain that excitement when moving on to things that actually, you know, either there are competitors that are kind of coming into the space mm. or, you know, you've ticked a lot of boxes already. So mm. although the niche is huge, you're kind of saturating areas of that or the most loyal people within that. Yeah, it's a journey. It's definitely a journey. And I think you start by hiring interesting people. Mm -hmm. So we, we had more and more people who were doing different types of cycling. So we weren't all sitting there in doing the same kind of rides in the same kind of place, watching racing, being like me. I started to hire people who started who were really into Audax and adventure rides where they go off for, you know, 12, 15, 24, 36 hours doing mm. these crazy adventures. Then I started hiring people who were racers. Then we started hiring people who were into mountain biking. And then there was people who were hardcore commuters who only sort of, you know, knew that. Obviously, we hired women and women were kind of like, well, actually, I want to ride like this and I mm -hmm. want these sort of products. So the more people we built into the team, the more opportunities we got to, to broaden the range and go into different aspects of cycling. Um, plus the sport develops, you know, things move on. And of course. There's an innovation. It's such a powerful driver to have better fabrics and, you know, different fits. And in fact, cycling has gone through a massive revolution. It used to be all flappy and baggy. Mm. And now it's horribly tight and aerodynamic and everything's about watts and power. And 
it sort of disappeared into nothingness. You know, mm-hmm. The best cycle wear now is almost being naked, right. which, is, which is not great for <laughs> a clothing brand. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to work for me. <laughs> but yeah, the, those trends happen. And yeah, then you've got this other group of people who are just wanting to wear T-shirts and mm. be much more kind of, I don't want to look like that because that's, mm. that's trying a bit hard. So I want to be more like an adventurer and more outdoorsy. Mm. So you just have to go with those things and see them before they start becoming big and then you know try and mm. lead them. And naturally as a niche becomes less niche there are going to be more kind of tangen- tangential um developments of of those kind of things as you say people who would kind of want to be part of the lifestyle but actually don't care about wearing more than a t-shirt yeah I, when i assume there was a point that big competitors started really taking you know the the bigger players who have a lot higher budgets and a lot more um who can kind of you know, when you're talking to investors there, they always say, what stops a big player coming in and doing this right now? For us, it's always, well, you, they're not going to be able to match us on sustainability anywhere close, yeah. even if, you know, no matter what they kind of flex. How how were you able to kind of fend that off and continue doing what you were doing? By us not succeeding, mm-hmm. which, by which I mean... The fact that the sport isn't the most popular sport in the world and you haven't been in a bike shop and it's not relevant to loads of people, we haven't finished the job. And because we haven't finished the job, for brands like Nike and Adidas and, you know, the big guys, it's just not interesting enough. It's the exact same with sustainability. (laughs) Right. And and they will get there when we've succeeded, but we've got plenty of opportunity to grow in the meantime. And my biggest worry was that Nike, who'd done a bit of cycling stuff, Mm. Lance Armstrong was When I think about it, I actually just can't think of them having done cycling properly. I mean, my dad is a big cyclist. I kind of wake up and it will be 7 a.m. and he'll be like, oh, I've just cycled 300 miles. And I'll be like, there cool. You go. He's great. one of us. <laughs> he absolutely is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a fangirl moment when I... But Nike used to do the yellow jersey. So they were the, you know, the yellow jersey sponsor. The tick right. was here. So they, they ticked that one. Armstrong was a Nike athlete and he's mm-hmm. the most famous cyclist of all time, probably. Um, and they did shoes and they, they were sort of dabbling and they were doing it quite well because they're mm. Nike. They know how to make nice content. And I was thinking, we've got to really get this right because yeah. those guys crank it up. But then literally a, a year in, they decided they weren't going to do cycling mm. because it could only be a three billion pound business. You know? So it's not <laughs> worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not worth my time. Yeah. Um, but I would also say as part of that, you know, when you have spent so much time building a brand and building that lifestyle and building that community, that cannot be replicated on on such a scale as someone like Nike. They can create pockets of community. They have an amazing community around, say, like high performance and it being about, you know, going for gold and all of these things. But actually, when when you've created this idea of belonging in a community, taking that outside of a niche and putting it into a mass market, it's not as appealing. Yeah, I think that's right. I think they could force their way into credibility by mm-hmm. having great innovation and they've got way more money to spend on that. But they're not going to get the deep engagement, the mm-hmm. belonging that you talk about. And I think our community, you know, it's proper, they're proper members. You know, they pay to be part of the, you know, some of them, 25,000 of them pay to be part of our community, not through buying product, but just through subscription. So they're really in it. And they're not just going to suddenly leave because, unless we do things wrong, which we mm-hmm. doesn't do. But um, that's quite hard to replicate. And I think there's so much talk of community, but it just means a cohort of customers, really. Yeah. When it's really powerful, it's when it's real engagement. Of course. And are you, you know, you're a brand guy. So obviously one of the, the biggest things as well that's important to kind of mention is that's exactly why you build brand. You build something that's not just, yes, the product is fantastic, but this brand, it's not just about stamping our name on things, it's about the associations that our brand has in order to be able to kind of, if we do stamp it on something, you know what that stands for. And yep. you're almost giving a, you know, especially with fashion as an expression of the self, you're almost able to say, if you're wearing Rafa, this is who I am, this is what I love, and I'm part of this community. Yeah, that's 100% what we've done, 100%. And it gets harder as you get bigger mm. because you start to have all this baggage around your brand. And sometimes when you're the big guy, that says something. And you know, the, the, there's opportunities for niche brands to come in underneath you and start pecking away, which definitely happens. And that's okay. It just means it's harder as you get bigger, mm. not easier. And how have you found that transition from being kind of a small community-led brand to being, well, a big company? It, it, it's... um. It's a challenge, but it's the right, it's the challenge we have to 
of course take you know we have to be up for it so when i was sort of handing over to the new ceo and talking to all the staff about you know what matters it all came down to one very simple yin yang diagram model basically which comes from some academics called Collins and Porras years ago who wrote in the 90s about what makes successful companies. And basically it's on one side is all about authenticity. You know, if we don't do that, it's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. In one year, two years, five years, 10 years, it will go. You have to stay. If you're a sports brand and if you're a brand that's about this kind of lifestyle, you have to be authentic. But on the other side, and, and that's authentic, authenticity is really easy if you keep it small. It's really easy because you can just dive down, dive down, yeah. and keep getting more and more specialist. The trouble is the other side of the yin yang model is you've got to grow. Yeah. Because that's our purpose. Our purpose is all about getting the world to live life by bike and to love what we love. Mm -hmm. Like it or not, that's what we set out to do. And so you have to grow. And the tension between those two things is the whole journey. That's what the business is about at the moment. And it's really hard. But the tent. Tension is great. You know, tension mm. is what makes things really interesting and you get great stuff out of tension. And were there times that you found that kind of really challenging in terms of maintaining the authenticity and the soul of your brand whilst also saying, oh my God, we've got to hit this number or we've got to get out to this many people? I think I never found it difficult at all. Mm. I think people who work with me of course. have often found it really hard because they don't quite, it's either... Lots of people want the world to be binary. Mm -hmm. You know, the world seems to be getting more and more binary, whereas in fact it is shades of grey. So I'm really happy sitting in the middle. But they were, I thought, well, if we're going to be more accessible and we're going to embrace DEI and the stuff that we are doing, then surely we have to leave behind the suffering and the sort of like hardcore. Mm. And does racing really matter anymore because we're about this? It's like, oh, well, no, we have to do both. And, mm. and likewise, if we're all about authenticity and racing, then can we really be, you know, embracing these you know, different body types and ages and colors mm. and what have you it's like well yes we have to do both yeah so i think they found it really difficult and you just have to show them how to tread the line and we'll get it wrong often we know it's you swing like this but overall you're still heading in the right direction so you've have you fully exited now uh i'm still um a director i still do a few days a month so mm -hmm. no i haven't I don't know what the word is for what I do, but it's, yeah. it's not. I'm not semi-retired. I'm sort of. I've stepped down. I'm doing different Floating. things. I'm in a different <laughs> chapter of my life. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. And, and do you worry then that on a if you were to fully exit at any point, do you worry that those kind of non-binaries that you need to be able to keep in place because you hold that the kind of yeah. key to that soul of the company? Do you ever worry that that would fall to one side or the other? Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's the thing that would definitely make me <laughs> really concerned. And I do sometimes worry about that. But I spent so long trying to build the culture to get it. And I've, sp I've bored them s relentlessly about it. But then, you know, new people come in and you have to in induct them. more people relentlessly. Well, you have to bore them, exactly. So we've now got films that they can watch. You sound so fun to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it is a bit like that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, per we have this core value called suffer, which is... Yeah, it's a challenging word, and but it's so related to what the experience of cycling is and what life is, I think. Mm. And it doesn't mean hurt yourself. It just means go at it, you know, don't give up, be persistent, be ambitious, push yourself harder than you've ever pushed yourself. And only then will you get something that's valuable. So it's really important. But we call it suffer because it's that's what it is. You know, is that we don't have to make it all sort of fluffy. Yeah. But at least once a month somebody would come into my office and go, and I'm quite open and quite, I'm hopefully not intimidating at all as a, as a leader. So they'd come in and they'd say, so yeah, this, this word suffer, can we change our core value? When are we going to change it? PR that? people. Well, <laughs> Look at in and be like, so, yeah, well, let's definitely. have a word about this. So it makes their life very difficult. You're trying to get people who don't care about cycling to want to ride a bike, mm -hmm. and yet your core value is suffer. suffer. <laughs> come and spend your weekend And so suffering. I have to sit them down and say, yes, let, let me t explain yeah. why this is the core value. And also let me explain, you don't change your core values because mm -hmm. they're your core values. It's kind of like you become somebody else when you do that. But what we communicate isn't just the core values. You know, what you say doesn't, it's not as overt as that. So we mm. don't go out saying, hey, suffer, you guys. Yeah, rather yeah, we, suffering. Exactly. <laughs> suffering for fun. Which for the first 10 years, we could almost do that. Yeah. Because that because was it, going straight people to People understood mindset. it so much. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I do do that. Mm. And then it was open to parody. So we had people sort of, you know, making fun of us being sort of epic and 
black and white and all that stuff. But it was it was it totally hit home. People knew exactly mm. what it was. Now we have to communicate in a more sophisticated, subtle way to different audiences. Of um, course, it's just growing up, isn't it? So I want to speak to you a bit about um, the kind of full journey of Rafa. So you started Rafa in two thousand and four and sold it for two hundred million in dollars. Dollars in important distinction. Yes. Um, in two thousand and seventeen, um, and I feel like you know entrepreneurship is often presented as a kind of freedom filled no boss lifestyle um but also a kind of almost like a quick fix i think a lot of the time now on social media it's seen as this like key to freedom and it's seen as this ability to be able to build something scale something live an amazing life while you're doing it and then exit it within three years um I'm sure those kind of 13 years didn't feel very freedom filled at times. I'm sure they were incredibly exciting, but not necessarily hugely um, that kind of key to freedom. What would you say to people, firstly, who want to get into kind of entrepreneurship for this idea of, I guess, kind of having no boss and being your own boss and all of that? It's really hard, isn't it? Because there are no shortcuts and, Mm -hmm. and it isn't that easy quick fix, quick win, you know, it happens to some people, but good luck to them. Yeah. Yeah. You can't plan for that. That's just exceptional. On the other hand, I would encourage everyone to consider doing it because working for yourself is the best thing and it's easier than it's ever been to work for yourself. You know, the tools that you can have, they're just all there, Mm -hmm. but it's bloody hard. So I would, I would encourage anybody to give it a go, but know that you've got to almost be prepared to kill yourself to make it work. And along the way, it's all about execution. It's not about having the best plan. It's not about having the right kind of investment. It's not, as you're finding out, you know, you you have to do all these steps. But on their own, they don't guarantee success. You have to keep pushing, keep pushing, and there's more and more you have to do. So I, I just think people have to go in with their eyes open and be prepared to absolutely kill themselves to do it, suffer to do it. Mm. Having said that, I felt totally free. You know, freedom's an interesting word. I, mm. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, I, you know, I have a disabled son and my wife wasn't doing what she wanted to do. She was looking after him primarily. And so I was always conscious that I had this privilege to be able to pursue this thing. So A, it had better work. You mm. know, I had more drive to make it work. But secondly... I mean, you know, it's got to be everything. It's got to be perfect. Mm. And I should really enjoy it. So I love every minute of what I do. It was, I never for a second, even when dealing with the bank or, you know, yeah. letting somebody go, you know, horrible things you have to do. It never felt like work. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of different type of freedom. It's not freedom of you can do whatever you want today. It's freedom of you can do exactly what you want today to make it to where you want to be in 10 yeah. years or whatever it might yeah. be. But, it, but the, to, your po- to your question, the long-term nature of it, I think, is really important. Mm. And my view of what brands are and can be is probably a bit old-fashioned now. It was sort of framed in the 90s. And it's, it's about brands creating social change and representing thousands, you know, communities of thousands or hundreds mm. of thousands of people and really being meaningful. And you don't do that in one, two, five years. You know, that takes 20, 30 years. And if you get it right, they can last for 50 to 100 years. And that's what's interesting to me, not just blowing something up and flipping it for a nice bit of money. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about that. So we see, again, a lot online now about these brand success stories that have got often a huge amount of funding, sometimes bootstrapped, but have essentially gone from zero to 100 in three to five years. Um, you played the long game. I think that you, you know, you did fantastically very early on um, as part of that, but it wasn't measured necessarily by being valued at, you know, 200 million or being a unicorn or all of these things that are kind of seen as this like entrepreneurship end goal and entrepreneurship success story. What do you think that, first of all, kind of why did you play the long game? And also what do you think that of this kind of view that that is what, brand Mm. building should be. Mm. I think there's a lot to unpick in that. I think, why do you start a company? You know, I I never had the ambition to make loads of money. I mean, clearly I wanted to make some money because Mm -hmm. I've got dependents and that would be quite nice. But that wasn't why I got up in the morning. That wasn't why I went, hawked a business plan around. 
yes, you have to have an exit and you have to have ways of your investors getting their return, but that was just incidental to building something. And it's all about building the thing and the impact that has. It was a creative act. It wasn't a ruthless financial act. That would We just did enough of that to make sure the investors were okay and that I made some money. But it was never the driving force, and it, it never should be, I don't think. And all the joy comes from the other stuff. Mm. Yeah, we never once celebrated. Well, we, no, maybe we did when we crossed 100 million quid turnover or whatever. You know, you mm. have these milestones, but they were much less important than one of our sponsored athletes winning a race or, yeah. you know, that was, or our team going out and riding together 100 miles. Or, that was what mattered, not the, not, not the, sort of the, the tick of being worth a certain amount of money or making lots of money. That's, mm -hmm. That goes quite quickly. And so what advice would you give to people who want to start a business who maybe haven't necessarily found their kind of like blue ocean, you know, yeah, this yeah, like blank yeah. space, a blank canvas to be able to um, develop, but want to be able to, you know, just, just build a great brand, make it into something great, make some money. I think be curious, mm -hmm. you know, look, look really hard, keep looking. If you haven't found it, just keep looking and you'll, you will find it. There's a million opportunities out there. And I know it feels to, certainly with the pervasive internet, it feels like everything's been done. Mm. I'm sure to younger people, it's like, oh God, I can't do that because it's been done by that person or that person or, you know, Grace has done it or whatever. You see all that stuff and so you think maybe there's no opportunities. There are a million opportunities to do things better and to create value for people. And that's all that starting a brand is doing is creating value. You just got to keep looking, be curious, be relentless, keep looking. And when you find something, just do it, you know, just execute, make it happen, risk something, have a go. It might blow up, it might be rubbish, you know, you might lose your shirt, but you don't know until you've tried. And all business plans are just, you know, useless documents that are worth nothing until you've done it. So you just have to do it. Um, it's hard though, you have to have confidence to do that. And I, I'm lucky that I've always been very secure and confident from my background and my upbringing and all sorts of other things. And I was a bit older when I started as well. If I hadn't, if I was 25, I might not have mm. been able to do any of the things that I was doing. So that was helpful. But you've got to try and find that confidence from mm. you know, deep within yourself. And what, what do you think it was that gave you that confidence? Uh, my parents being totally supportive. I was the eldest child, so mm. I was kind of like given everything I wanted, and, <laughs> but also given boundaries. And yeah. It was a very secure upbringing, which is quite rare these days, and I was, mm -hmm. you know, lucky to have that. And they took me to, you know, places in Europe, and I was able to do certain things. And I never once was told I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, you know, they celebrated success, but not in a horrible sort of, you know, over the top way. It was just correct, I mm -hmm. think. And, I, and at the time, I had no idea that's what was happening. But now I look back and think, wow, compared to lots of my friends, it was incredibly stable and supportive and is that how you try and raise your children i suppose so I and mean, we have this weird life where my 27 year old is you know is very disabled so there's a different lens in our lives which is which creates a lot of anxiety and stress and it's been hard to shield the other two from that you mm -hmm. know it, it is our life our life is our son and all of us so we do as much as we can to do that um and to show the right way be good people you know i honestly i hate the idea of having to be ruthless and you know that, that expression it's just business i hate that it's yeah, never just no. business it's people doing yeah. stuff together so i think we try and model the right behavior but we probably don't succeed and there's a lot of stress with living in a disabled family so mm. you know yeah well i think that is a fantastic place to end you've shared a huge <laughs> lot of stress living in a disabled <laughs> family that's great <laughs> <laughs> do what I do it's great no, but yeah. I think what you've been able to share is like a really kind of open and honest view in terms of the the realities of both the brand side but also the impact that has from you know what you're doing on the everyday and what what means a lot to you kind of from um from a home standpoint as well and how you try and do things I think that just doing things as a good person stands for so much as you yeah. say it's not it's not about you know, it's never just about business. When you're when you're interacting with a person, when you're building something with people, it's never just that. Um, yeah. And especially if you're building kind of a community-based business and a business around people, 
it's always going to matter what those people are thinking and what those people are feeling. And I think that is incredibly important. Yeah, and it's and the the more the older I get, the more I think those human relationships, relationships with the customer, so brilliant. It's such a nice thing to do. And you know, traveling the world to meet customers in you know, in Taiwan or in mm. California or wherever, it's just brilliant. Because mm. that's all we do as human beings is deal with other people. You know, it's the most satisfying thing you can do. So yeah. Amazing. Well thank you so much. You're welcome.